Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, coming from you from the Pat Mayo Experience Temporary Studio. Eventually, we're gonna look super great, but for now, you just get my beautiful visage. I want to let everyone know that there's more Pat Mayo Experience I experiences, experience I, whatever it is, there's more shows. Coming down the pike on Wednesday, Davis Maddock makes his return to the program to break down the entire Sunday main slate, which no longer includes the Sunday night football game. So we'll be talking about that from a DraftKings perspective. Thursday, game picks and preview. Friday, we're going to have the injury report and DraftKings ownership. And if you missed out on yesterday's show on Monday, Tim Andacust was on the show to break down the waiver wire and recap the week. So go back, check it all out, and please give the show a like. Help support the show. Spread it around. Share it. Do what you have to do. I recommend giving it to your fantasy league mates because I give out terrible advice. And if they start listening to me, be like, hey, this Pat Mayo guy, he knows what he's talking about. And then you send them me, you send them the clip of me, and I'll tell them to do something. Then they do it, and then you'll probably beat them. So it's win-win for everyone. Just remember that. Anyway, Jake Seeley from RotoExperts.com and Fantasy Sports Network and Fantasy Radio is on the line, as he is for every rankings debate show. Jake, you're looking super HD today. I don't know. A little bit of an upgrade over here. Can you believe it? I cannot. <laughs> Yeah, this is the only uh, inside between us. Yeah, it's it's nice to see this a nice little upgrade over here. I also do appreciate uh, the favorite tweet that I got Sunday morning, but I, from you, I see your rankings, but I'm curious of who you would start. Well, I mean, I should have listened to you last week. I mean, we, generally speaking, we were very much on the same page, but you said I had Buck Allen ranked way too highly, and you were right about that. Although he's someone I want to talk about just in a little bit when we get into the running back rankings, because I was actually encouraged by his usage uh, and his floor in a game where he did absolutely nothing and that team did absolutely nothing. And you called me an idiot for having Larry Fitzgerald too low, and you were right. So congratulations on that. I let my recency bias get in the way of me. So I hope everyone listened to Jake. This is why you're a top four accuracy ranker in the industry. Uh, whatever. Their, their new system is kind of whack. Oh, because <laughs> so now that you're losing, you're, you're not first no, anymore? I, it's all out of whack? No, I, I, I did fine last year. I just, if, it doesn't make sense if you think about it. So now they do it is basically if you finish at the position and the expected point scores. So even if, like, let's say last week, you had uh, Rob Gronkowski at number two because Mercedes Lewis was the top guy and you lost points for Gronkowski no matter what. You lost like 13 points because Mercedes Lewis went off at the number one position. That seems strange. But everyone lost an equivalent amount of points because I doubt Mercedes Lewis was even ranked by most people. Right, but you get hit by bigger gaps than there were before. There's a lot of people that don't like it as much. I'm one of them. All right. Well, when you come dead last, we know you have a built-in excuse <laughs> now. But I'm a fringe top ten instead of the uh, top five. Yeah, we'll, but, we'll talk. Anyway, so you're doing well. So unlike me, who doesn't participate but just assumes he would come dead last, I want to get into my rankings, my running back rankings for week four. At the top, there's a new number one, Lev Bell, uh, in a what appears to be a tough matchup against Baltimore is not number one. Kareem Hunt is going to be number one. Uh, then Shady, Bell, Devonta Freeman, Jay Ajayi, Todd Gurley, Delvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, and Ty Montgomery are the top 10. These are PPR scoring formats. If you want half point PPR or standard, go check out Jake's rankings up on rotoexperts.com. Always there, plus on Fantasy Pros as well. Jake uh, shares it for everyone. I just do PPR. Too much work for me to do anything else. Uh, Hunt. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because I asked Cuss this on Monday's show. Rest of the season, running back. I would still go Bell over Hunt. Would you agree or disagree? I would still absolutely agree. And a lot of people have been asking me about those in trades and saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to get that in a trade. And then people are coming back, wow, I can't believe the Le'Veon Bell gave up, the, the owner gave up Le'Veon Bell for Kareem Hunt. I actually had one person who got Le'Veon Bell end for Kareem Hunt. Ooh, that's not bad. I, I think this is a much closer discussion in standard leagues, but in PPR, we yeah. saw it last week. Bell had a terrible game and scored 22 fantasy points. <laughs> that's because he gets like 30 touches almost every single week. It's just, as you always mention when it comes to PPR, these running backs that even if they only get 15 carries, if you add in six, seven receptions, it's just a whole different ball game. That's what made Le'Veon Bell and David Johnson a tier of their own. So now it is Le'Veon Bell. I'd still take Le'Veon Bell. I'm buying low if any owner is panicking. And if you want to scream hunt, no problem. I'll do that straight up every single day. Well, before we get into the debate of the rankings, let me run through the 11 through 20 range as well, just to get more perspective because I do want to get to Buck Allen based off what you just said. So it goes Melvin Gordon, Leonard, Fournette, AJ or CJ, Anderson, Carlos Hyde, Jordan Howard, Chris Carson, DeMarco Murray, Tariq Cohen, Chris Thompson, and Joe Mixon. Buck Allen's number 21 
on that list. The one thing I really liked that I saw from Buck Allen was the five catches, obviously. If that's going to sort of be his floor in games where he doesn't do anything, that makes him a viable, startable running back. He might not be one of your best two running backs, but if you play in a deeper league or you punted running back or went zero running back, I think that's a very encouraging sign to see. I also like that Terrence West put the ball on the ground. Now, Alex Collins came in at the end of the game to get a lot of the work between the tackles. When we look at pure snap count, Buck Allen's still playing over 50% of those snaps. I like that a lot. I still think that he is a running back two for the season. Um, What do you make of Buck Allen? I'm with you on this. I actually did my sleepers for my rankings this week before I came on the show, and one of my sleeper running backs was Buck Allen. And I said I know everybody was pissed off about last week, but the Steelers' pass defense is a lot better than their run defense. They're actually giving up over 22 fantasy points per game, and that's standard. And if you saw what happened last week with a banged-up Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen and what they did to the Steelers, and if you look at the opportunity here, they've given up, uh, what is it, the fifth-most rushing yards. So the fifth-most rushing yards, the touchdowns, are a little bit lower than you'd expect with that, but that's why I feel confident in it because Buck Allen is still the lead. I know people are talking about Alex Collins, and Terrence West is still there if healthy, but it is Buck Allen's backfield as the lead option. So I do like him. I I have him as a fringe RB2 as well. There are very few people who had faith in Jordan Howard and DeMarco Murray. So and I want to tell everyone, me, I was not one of those people. I had them ranked very lowly in, like, the upper 30s. Like, I... From all reports, it didn't seem like they were going to play all that much, and it led to an overranking on my part of Derrick Henry. I actually benched Jordan Howard in the league. Fortunately, it worked out in my favor. I played Buck Allen over him. I, that didn't work out too well. But this week, are we just expecting everything to go back to normal? Because this Howard-Cohen backfield. I have Howard at number 15, Cohen at number 18. I think that they can both coexist. We've seen examples like this in the past, especially in offense. It's generally in better offenses, like we saw it with Sproles and Pierre Thomas one year, uh, Reggie Bush, and I think Joyke Bell in Detroit one season. It's just the yeah. Bears have so few actually good receiving options that Cohen's just going to be on the field even sometimes at the same time as Jordan Howard. And one thing that we saw in this game that we're not going to see from the Bears moving forward a lot and – I might actually have led to an overranking of Jordan Howard for me this week was they were winning for most of that game. If they're winning, Jordan Howard's going to be on the field looking good and running the ball. If not, I think that Cohen probably outsnaps him. I could definitely see that. And it's why, yes, yeah, so since week one, we've been talking about it, it says that Cohen has standalone value. And it's really, if you want to liken it to another team, Look at the Jets last year with the Matt Forte and Bilal Powell usage. And like Ter- Tariq Cohen's going to see, as you just said, more use when they're down, more when they're passing. They can both be on the field at the same time. Uh, the Kendall Wright wasn't even <laughs> or registered last week. That, that's how bad their team was. If you look at their re- leading receivers, Cohen's up there at the top because – it's abysmal right now. So I think that Cohen has standalone values similar to Darren Sproles. I called him the new Darren Sproles. Unfortunately, he's actually got to be the new Darren Sproles now because Darren Sproles is done for, which is sad to see. But you're right. And I think it's a little bit high for Jordan Howard only because of two factors. Is One is, let, let's go back to that too. Somebody tweeted me and said, how did everybody in the industry miss on Jordan Howard? Well, it's because everybody saw he was banged up and barely used the week before. Everybody saw him barely practicing again through the week. And everybody assumed that John Fox was going to go down the road of what he did last week. But then John Fox does what he always does. He John's Foxes us. And yes, they were up, and as you mentioned. But this is a game we expect him to be behind. That's one point. And then two... I don't know if I can trust him any given week. I'm selling high if I can get rid of him for RB1 value right now, as much as I still think he is an RB1 if he's healthy. Well, I actually just traded Jordan Howard in one of my money leagues this morning. Uh, It's a 14-teamer. I actually have a pretty good base at running back. I had Jordan Howard. Um, I have Buck Allen. Uh, I actually picked up Chris Johnson. And I have someone else who's like not. Oh, Carlos Hyde is my other running back. And I had Jordan Howard. And I have been struggling at quarterback, weirdly enough, for the first few weeks. Like, I've been streaming Carson Palmer. I used Kaiser last week, which turned out to be pretty good. Uh, I traded him straight up for Aaron Rodgers. And I don't normally nice. like to go to the if i'm gonna go to the very top uh for any position i think that's okay uh normally i would try to stream week to week but this just seemed like a no-brainer to me i might miss jordan howard but i feel like he may not replicate what he did last week the rest of the season i think that he's probably an rb2 and i feel like i got rb1 value for him by getting rogers i know that when i drafted i picked jordan howard in the second at the beginning of the second round rogers didn't go until i think the middle of the third round but the draft doesn't matter anymore it's about my team no. needs and with aaron Rodgers now anchoring my team and the rest of my team like i was able to pick up dig super late in that league um i have michael thomas in that league he was my first round pick so i feel like my overall team is very very solid and now i have aaron Rodgers who's the best quarterback, that's a trade that I think is plausible and a decent sell high off Jordan Howard having a good week. 
Yeah, and that's how you have to attack it. And the fact is, you know, St Jordan Howard, if still healthy, I would still hold to what I said in the preseason about being a top 10 running back. But as you said, the draft doesn't matter anymore, and he's not 100%. He even came out of that game was you know, the doctors. You saw him on the saw him on the sideline, lifting his arms and getting checked out and all that type of stuff. So that's just the question here. Is the fact is, if you're a Jordan Howard owner you have to keep them in your lineup. And to your point is because you have to keep in your lineup, there are going to be weeks where they're behind or he gets banged up again and maybe he gets you three points and you're just going to be stuck with that in your lineup. So if you have running back depth at all and you can get a return like you did, maybe even a running back and wide receiver if you're thin at wide receiver, you got to go do it at this point just because you have to play him. You can't bench him at this point. Well, one of the things that you said on last week's show was you would trade Jordan Howard straight up for Joe Mixon. Now, going into yes. this week, um, I don't think that you even need to make that trade. I think you could offer up Jordan Howard for Joe Mixon and something else and actually get a decent return with uh, Bill Laser as the offensive coordinator in Cincinnati. Now it seems like they're turning it over to Mixon. Not to say that Geo and Hill have gone away. They're still getting snaps. They're still getting touches. But Mixon was clearly a focal point of that offense, both through the receiving game when they were up, when the game was close. So that was really encouraging to see. I have Mixon number 20 in my ranks this week. The other guys are way down. And I even might be too low on it against the Browns, but I'm still sort of in wait and see mode when it comes to how big his upside is going to be, how much of an impact are those other guys gonna make i am i have a great deal of confidence but i think that before he has his big week and jordan howard i think is the perfect trade kind of compliment to him coming off of the big week i think you might be right rest of the season joe mixon just might be better yeah and the fact is he's healthy he was the most talented running back in the draft and bill laser the lasers are coming in and taking over and uh, boosting this offense I, I actually do have him higher I didn't highlight them because it's like four spots, I think. And usually I highlight, I go through and I do six or more. So he didn't make the cut for debating them too much. But I understand why you would still have him at 20. I mean, it's a big deck. 16 It's not a huge gap. No, and and you're really in on Mixon. I'm, you've sold me a bit on Mixon. I'm just not willing to go all in on him just yet to steal your name. I just think that he's a nice trade target now before he has one of these like 24 carry 120 yard two touchdown games. After that, like you're never going to be able to get him ever again. No, of course not. And I'm actually so to go further up your rank is if you want the uh, Los Angeles Rams abysmal against the run Ezekiel it needs to be higher. Come on. Uh, Zeke is number nine. And I know he ended up getting the touchdown late in the Monday night or just watching that game. He doesn't look right like he looks slow I, I do like that he's being involved in the passing game more and that was one of the things we talked about coming into the season that if he could boost his reception total he could just really have a severe impact in terms of his fantasy you know, upside and so far that's been really good it's really helped out his floor but I know the Rams aren't great on the ground I don't necessarily know if their defense is as bad as maybe as maybe it looked last Thursday night I just think where they got up by so much that the Niners didn't have as many problems moving the ball and by the time the game got close again you know, they were kind of checked out on playing really good defense, and they had to tighten up again. So, listen, Zeke's inside my top ten. You're playing Zeke. Uh, I just don't know if he's quite at the level of where he was last year. We know the offensive line saw a bit of a downgrade. Uh, maybe that's the impact. Maybe, you know, some of this off-the-field stuff is actually impacting him now. Yeah, see, Corey brought that up on a show today over with the fantasy football frenzy. Some people know Corey Parson. Like, a, everybody knows who Corey is. Yeah, just is, but, like, Corey was talking about it. I believe Corey. So, yeah, you're right, Pat. <laughs> I know. I, I like. I like that. I like that train of thought. <laughs> but he was saying the same thing that something didn't look right with him in last night's game, and I could see it. But he's like, "Oh, he should have scored in that one play. That should have been a touchdown." I said, like, uh, "He never had that super speed to break away." I could kind of see it. I thought he looked like 95%, like just maybe a little something was off. Maybe it is like if we want to create the narrative, something is in his head and he's just not right with this whole suspension thing still looming. But at the same time, I understand all of these things, and the offensive line is not playing as well. At the same time, it, it might be nitpick but I'm just I think the only people I would consider over him at this point are Hunt, Bell, and Freeman. All right, well, let's see if I can go through and I can try to make the case for the eight players that I have ranked ahead of him right now. Uh, and listen, the ranks are going to change right now. Let me clarify some injuries here of guys that aren't in the rankings and why the rankings may look like they do. I have Rob Kelly as playing this week. I have Melvin Gordon playing as the, this week. The guys I do not have in the rankings as of right now are assumed not to be playing Rex Burkhead, Kyle Jerz. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> hey, anyway, he's the triple word score 
Uh, Matt Forte <laughs> with the toe injury. Still no word on that yet, but I, I mean, I don't know. I really hope he doesn't play for my Bilal Pal shares, and I don't have Dwayne Washington, but no one cares about him anyway. So if you want to check out the updated rankings, go to dkplaybook.com or check out the description of this video, and all the links will be up there. You can check them out. They get updated all the way up until kickoff on Sunday, so don't worry about oh, wait, that. Set in permanently from now until kickoff? Yeah, really? no, no, they are. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 I don't even know if they're time-coded. I think they get time-coded uh, at the beginning of every day when I do update them but you'll see people move up and down throughout the week and you know sometimes what i think on tuesday when i make the rankings is not exactly what i think on sunday once i get some more information or things change just i, I just want to preface that for people out there so let's let's do this ezekiel elliott ranks number nine in my rankings right now like i said there are eight players ahead of him and Let's try to go through and make the case. Number one, Kareem Hunt. I think that one is obvious. He's been the best running back so far. He's number one in my rankings for a reason. I would play him over Elliott. LaShawn McCoy, his a lot, he's sort of like enhanced Buck Allen right now, where his floor is just incredible because the Bills have no one to really throw to outside of him and Charles Clay. I guess sometimes Jordan Matthews. And Atlanta has one of the worst run defenses at least so far this season and we know that the volume is going to be there i will just take the pass catching upside of mccoy versus bell in a primo matchup Le'Veon bell we talked about earlier just he's going to get 35 touches and he's going to back his way into 20 points no problem he is the best floor of any running back in football lev bell is higher than he's going to be devonta freeman has just looked electric so far and now woogie, woogie, woogie. after week one and weeks two and weeks three he's getting like 65 percent snap share the market shares there over Tevin Coleman and he's getting all the goal line carries in what has been a very explosive offense even up against the Bills I think the Falcons are going to score at home I would go with Freeman in that situation Jay Ajayi gets the softest matchup of the week against the Saints I know he's doing with the knee injury I don't care I think he rips them up in London that's just my personal bias going on to that matchup I think that Ajayi is in a great spot um, to come out Sunday morning and light up the Saints more so than Elliott is against the Rams uh, Todd Gurley is listen I'm not the biggest Todd Gurley fan in the world but I'm willing to admit that I was wrong on my preseason assessment he's getting all the usage the only guy that took him out of the backfield last week was Tavon Austin and now he's getting like four or five catches a game please that PPR floor is so high higher than Elliott's and the upside is the same because no one touches the ball inside the five yard line unless their name is Todd Gurley on the Rams Delvin Cook is basically Elliott light uh, he's getting the same amount of catches he's getting the same amount of market share uh, he's getting all the work in between the tackles and even on the goal line he's proving to be pretty good as well and he gets to the Lions I like that matchup just a little bit more uh, the Lions pass defense has been somewhat upgraded but I think you can still run on them quite effectively a lot like we saw Devonta Freeman do last week so I would go with that upside of Cook over Elliott here and Christian McCaffrey the guy might get 14 catches this week uh, against the Patriots I mean it's the only pass cam can complete in a PPR scoring like besides Bell McCaffrey might now have the highest floor without Greg Olson around that's my case for those guys over Ezekiel Elliott if you want to play Elliot or you like Elliot more go nuts but that's where I'm at <laughs> well I'll just give you the only case I have for Ezekiel Elliott that the only team giving up more fantasy points per game than the Rams uh, is what the Chargers I think I don't even know if the top I, of I, thought, I no, thought it was the Falcons Patriots. no it's the Patriots they're number two so the Patriots are number but they are the team with the second most. that's what I was thinking the second most rushing shards allowed and Chargers are number one but they've given up five rushing touchdowns because what do you do against the Rams you just beat them into the turf, and at the same time, when you're up by a score, and I expect the Cowboys to have this game in control, then you're going to see a lot more Ezekiel Elliott. So that's where I'm coming from, Ezekiel Elliott. Again, top 10, you're starting all these guys anyway. I just, against the Jay Ajayi, he actually has a better matchup than Jay Ajayi, just by a hair. Well, I mean, the Saints have given up the most yards overall. Uh, per game I think they're giving up 427 yards per game like you can score on the Saints from any which way that you choose <laughs> yeah, it, that's true I'm just again I would put in Ezekiel Elliott behind Devontae Freeman it's like what five spots but you're starting all these guys no matter what uh Chris Carson ranks in at number 16 where do I have CJ Pro sites at number 38 this just seems like a game where Seattle's going to get up by a bunch and continue to run the ball and the greatest thing from last week we saw with Carson what we expected coming into the week Rawls got one snap didn't touch the ball Eddie Lacy zero snaps this is Carson's backfield on the ground Pro Sites is going to work his way into the game when they need to pass or potentially even line up in the slot if Doug Baldwin doesn't play but I can see Carson getting 25 carries in this game 
I can definitely see it too, and that's the fact that these Indianapolis Colts look. You pass to beat the you pass to beat the Colts, but the problem is, is that that's how it works. And then when they're up at halftime, now you start running out the clock. So you're right there. You can pass to beat the Colts, but I mean, who have they really played with enhanced running games so far? They played the Browns, who can't do anything, and then they played the Cardinals, who can't run the ball. Yeah, but you can't call the Seahawks enhanced running game with that offensive line and Chris Carson as the lead. Hey, Chris Carson's looked good as the lead since he's taken over. It looks good, but I want to say enhanced. Enhanced is a little aggressive over there. Okay, I would say that the Seahawks running game is better than the Browns and Cardinals running game. Okay, there, that, that's fine. And if they're down Doug Baldwin, they might rely on the run a little bit more. I think he's a very safe play. So we, we talk about Buck Allen. Wendell Smallwood is right behind him at number 22. Then it's Crowell, Lamar Miller, Marshawn Lynch, Jaquiz Rogers, Tevin Coleman, Derrick Henry, Mike Gillisley, and my main man, Bilal Powell. Of course, that's assuming that Matt Forte doesn't play. And if Elijah McGuire does anything this week. I'm going to lose my mind. But I, I need to have some Bilal Powell as a flex PPR play. Just, just, just get him out once. Hopefully he can have a good game. Just to, to make me look not so terrible. But Wendell Smallwood is the big one that I want to talk about. I think he is a great pickup with Sproles at done for probably his career. Broken arm and torn ACL on the same play. That's rough treading. And a lot of people are just gravitating towards Blunt because he scored the touchdown. But when we look at snap count, it was Wendell Smallwood playing over 50% of the snaps. He tied for the team lead in terms of total rushes. He's going to be used in the passing game. Like, this is an opportunity right here that, you know, it might not work out. But very few circumstances jump up like this where there's an injury. People are kind of unsure how this backfield is going to unfold. I could see Smallwood playing 65% of the snaps in this game. And if they get down, he can be on the field even more. Like, I'm not sweating blood. I'm not sweating Clement, except for potentially goal line stuff. And that's why that Smallwood isn't ranked higher than he is right now, because I don't know how many touchdowns he's going to score. But I just think that he's going to have a very good volume game. How it turns out, anyone's question. But I'm here to project volume and potential fantasy points off of that. And I like Wendell Smallwood. Yep, uh, you, I just mentioned it before, too. The Chargers are allowing the most rushing yards in the league so far. And wait, you don't want to take a gamble on the guy who literally did nothing in Week 2 in LeGarrette Blunt, Or you want to take the fact that Clement act, got a touchdown on, what was it, seven carries? So, you know, here's the factors, like you just said. is It's with Sm- Wendell Smallwood. This opportunity, you have to take it. Blow your number one waiver spot. Go grab him if your waivers haven't run yet. Spend a lot of your budget if you need running back help because he could potentially be a top 15, top 20 running back the rest of the way. Obviously, as you said as well, he could potentially bust out. We could just get a complete committee back here and be frustrated every single week. But the potential is here. He is Darren Sproles filling that role, but he can even do a little bit more by running between the tackles a little bit better than Sproles can. So you have to take this opportunity, and I love this matchup this week. I have Chris Thompson at number 19. I have Rob Kelly at number 31. It looks like he's going to play. Gruden's already come out and said that he's still the league dog over your main man, Samaj P. Henson. And I just don't know about this matchup. One of the reasons that I like Thompson, but I like Smallwood more as a waiver wire pickup, even in PPR formats, is that I think that game flow is going to dictate a lot of what happens with Chris Thompson. In games where the skins are not favored and they are you know, underdogs and they're probably going to have to pass a lot, I would expect to see Chris Thompson on the field. But I don't think that's going to be an every week thing. And I think that his upside is going to be capped because they're not going to run him out there for 70% of the snaps ever. That's never going to happen. He's going to be around like 40 to 50 almost every week, which has value, especially in PPR formats. You know, Chris Thompson's my guy, but like, let's not get crazy here. I've been seeing people always a top 10 back. No problem. Rest of the season. Like, let's pump the brakes a little bit, people. (laughs) You're hundred percent right. And the fact is, this is your guy. This is the guy that you have in PPR, like almost every single year. But Gruden already came out and said, he's like, oh, I'm not going to give him more touches no matter how much he demands and obviously more touches is the assumption is significantly more he might see a few more snaps a few more touches because you can't ignore what he's been doing so far but you look at it, the touchdown rate is not going to continue on what he's been doing so far he's not going to get those busted plays where somebody just forgot to cover that guy you know hey we, we might want to cover the running back out of the backfield so that's not going to happen every single week either but you have to love what he's doing for this team rob kelly it, like you said is supposed to be back but the most explosive player out of his backfield is thompson he's been explosive all the way back to college it's just his inability to stay healthy and that's why Gruden's not going to do what you just said he's not going to let him be on the field 60 70 percent of the time because he's not somebody who can handle that and is probably going to get hurt and teams are going to scheme against him now now that they know that he's a thing and scores 70 yard touchdowns every single week uh, they yeah. might want to just try to take him out of the game that that might work because I mean, oh, that's honestly why I'm a little bit concerned this week with the Kansas City Chiefs in their front seven I can see that, but that might lead to a lot of dump-offs to Thompson. Right. 
And PPR definitely helps, but for the people that were thinking starting them in standard, that's where uh, it depends on your other options. Uh, do you think that I have Marshawn Lynch, number 25, too low in the rankings? I'm starting to get worried about his usage, and I don't love the matchup against Denver. No, it is the matchup. One, I will say one thing is people always overrate the Denver run defense. It's actually middle of the pack. It's the pass defense that's just so great. With that being said, it's only middle of the pack. It's not like it's somebody you want to be matched up against. And, yeah, the usage so far is a little bit concerning. I don't know whether it's the fact of they know how much wear is on his tires and the year off and they don't want him touching the ball 20-plus times in a game. But I expected a lot more usage so far. The yards have at least been there, but he's got to also find the end zone. And this might not be a week where they score too much. Yeah, I can see that as well. Is there anyone else from the running back position that you wanted to highlight, talk about, or maybe we had way off in the ranks? Uh, the only one that's way off for me is Derrick Henry is too high for me, especially in a PPR, just because DeMarco Murray, I guess he was fine because that, that's another one just like Jordan Howard, lied to everybody. The usage was off the charts. The hamstring was fine, took that play for 70-plus yards. And a matchup in Houston, I just don't expect that much Derrick Henry this week. I think we're back into that 7 to 12 carry per game situation again. I think you can run on Houston, though. Yeah, I, I just don't see – this is the biggest thing. It's the same thing I said last week about him. It's the volume. It's similar to Chris Thompson. It's the volume. Is how many touches is he really going to get every single week if DeMarco Murray is healthy and out there? And DeMarco Murray wasn't even 100% last week, and he dominated the touches. It's funny. On his, like, 75-yard touchdown run, it looked like he was noticeably limping the entire time. <laughs> Yet he still beat everyone to the end zone. <laughs> I know, that, and that's the other worrisome part. Yeah, I, he's, he's Jordan Howard for me, too, in the same vein, in the fact that if I can sell high, I'm going to sell high just to avoid that frustrating situation. All right, well, even to swing back to Henry for a second, I have him at number 28. Where would you you move him to like where do you have him at in your rankings i would put him right in front of chris johnson so that would go in in my rankings right now it goes henry gillisley powell rob kelly jonathan stewart james white theo riddick chris johnson so you would move him behind theo riddick yeah behind james white and theo riddick especially in a ppr i'm i i guess theo riddick generally does kill the vikings maybe i should move him up a little bit but like i'm just worried that they really seem committed to using abdullah despite the fact that it doesn't work yeah, they definitely do. But also, Theo Riddick saw plenty in the first two weeks. Well, not plenty, but a decent amount in the first two weeks. It just whatever. They didn't need him last week, and it was a perfect matchup, and everything was there. We know the Falcons gave up the most receptions, receiving yards, receiving touchdowns to running backs last year, and they got obliterated in the first two games. But it's just everything else was working just fine, and that defense has stepped up. So I think you see Theo Riddick is in a PPR. It's hard for me not to trust him. Just trust, and that's what I'm going for here, is trust him and the receptions over Derrick Henry. All right, let's switch to receivers coming in at number one, as he is wont to do every single week. Oh, wait, you don't want me to rank Mark Ingram? You don't want to tell me where he's No, you in? know what? I'm done with it. Do you even want to rank Mark Ingram anymore? Not really. No, of course not. He's terrible. <laughs> terrible. This, Good. I, I'm I, glad that's I put him in the 20s for what it's worth, but I don't know exactly where. I have him in, I have him in first place. Of worst <laughs> place, because he's the worst. Alvin Kamara is way better. Oh, he definitely in PPR. I may, actually have to, I may actually have to move Adrian Peterson to worse place, too, because he's also terrible. Oh, and no, Adrian Peterson's retired place. That's where he just needs to be. <laughs> All right, wide receivers coming at number one. We have Antonio Brown, and then it goes Odell Beckham. He's healthy. He's back. He gets the ball. He gets red zone targets. He good. A.J. Green, Jordy Nelson, Julio Jones, dealing with a bit of a back injury, but I don't expect it to be too big of a problem. Mike Evans, Brandon Cooks, Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, and DeAndre Hopkins coming at number 10. I'm going to quickly flow through these here. Uh, Stephen Diggs, uh, Manny Sanders, and DT, 12 and 13, back-to-back. Elshon -back. Jeffrey, Golden Tate, Tyreek Hill, Michael Crabtree, Des Bryant, Devontae Parker, and lucky Pierre Garçon comes in at number 20. And people need, or John Gruden at least. Was it John Gruden in the, did the, it was the ESPN guys who did the Thursday night game last week, right? Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't figure out what the CCD underneath the C and Garçon <laughs> was all about. It was pretty funny. Anyway, um, my main, Garçon is like carrying so many of my teams right now. Is like a wide receiver three who's, he had a really bad week too, but just getting big performances out of him. Do you think that 20 is too high for Garçon? Because I still feel like he's going to average close to double digit targets every game. 
You know, I initially highlighted them, and that's still a little bit aggressive for me. But here's what it comes down to is it's where they decide to use him this week because obviously Goodwin's not going to line up. He's going to be outside all the time. But if Peterson comes over to Garcon, now I'm really concerned. And the reason I say I don't know how they're going to use him is because I go back to the Detroit Lions game. And everybody was talking about, oh, Peterson's going to cover Golden Tate. And that didn't happen. Golden Tate got covered by Tyron Matthew. Well, no, he didn't get covered. He just abused Tyron Matthew the entire game, and they never switched over. So – I don't know if this happens again, but Peterson's been one of the few that does shadow. It didn't make sense why they didn't do it against the Lions. If he comes over to Garcon, we, Peterson, at this point, we might be able to argue he is the best shutdown corner in the NFL. If not, he's definitely top three. So that's my only concern with Garcon is does he get the Peterson treatment? If he's on Matthew, I'm not even concerned about it. All right, well, maybe I should put that more into the context of the rankings and make – I, I – I figured they would try to shift off of that and just, you know, just continue to pepper him. And I, even if Peterson's on him, they really have no other option, so they might just throw his direction anyway. And Pierre Garçon's hands have been top-notch so far this season. That catch he made in the Thursday nighter uh, over the head, like the tip well, of the of ball. his career. Yeah, I mean, listen, he's a very high catch rate guy. Uh, I just Even if he can run some easier routes or if they fall behind in this game, maybe the defense becomes lax. But I may mean, I'll factor that in. Where should I drop him down to? Because the rest of that range, starting at 21, goes Larry Fitzgerald and back on board. Now it's going to be a terrible week for him. Just watch. Marquise Lee, Devontae Adams, Adam Thielen, uh, Sammy Watkins, Randall Cobb, Chris Hogan, Richard Matthews, Jarvis Landry, and Martavis Bryant are that 21 to 30 range where would you drop Garcon down in there not far but part of it is like I would play him in front of Thielen because as of today it sounds like we might not have Bradford again that would change didn't matter last week (laughs) yeah because Case Keenum is doing even if Case Case Keenum started the rest of the season he would probably do that what two more times because that's what Case Keenum does he shows up two or three times in a year and has these games where like what the hell did this come from but to count on this every single week and that's actually I want to go to best Stefan Diggs in a second here but I would put him be in front of Thielen, but I would also have Watkins ahead of him, Cobb if he's out there. So he's probably he's in that 25 range, but it's because Thielen's behind those two guys for me. I worry about Sammy Watkins just just a little bit. Uh, maybe I'm not quite as sold as everyone else seems to be based off a Thursday night game or just everyone in the game score. I, I know the Rams have put up 40-plus twice this season. I don't think that's going to be like a common thing going forward. I do like this matchup, but he is right. dealing with a concussion issue, so I don't think he – I mean, Sammy Watkins is never a lock to play an entire game, but if he's already dealing with the dizzies, he might have more issues here. And this could be a situation where, hey, maybe they'll just bracket Sammy Watkins if they actually have the capability to do that. And Cooper Cup is back in the game. And Robert Wood is back in the game like Sammy Watkins is startable because he has gigantic upside but if you're looking for consistency I'm not sold on Sammy Watkins being an every week performer (laughs) why would you be because every single week there's a potential that he hits the IR again like in the middle of the game this is Sammy Watkins we all know that and it's not to do with the concussion it's the fact he's always finding ways to get hurt and he always is getting hurt and the foot supposedly not an issue now but it's always something with Sammy Watkins the upside is immense we saw it last week as you mentioned the real appeal here is the matchup and this is going to be another test I know that we've had three so far and we keep saying that about Jared Goff but you know let's see him go play Cowboys in Dallas let's see what happens here and I still like Watkins this week, but I understand the trepidation. It'll, you understand if you're building a lineup, too, is Sammy Watkins, if you already have another risk at wide receiver, you probably go with the safer option. If you have a safe lineup, you go with the upside. So I would play him in front of Garcon because I'm more worried about his matchup than Sammy Watkins' potential, but I could see why you would go either way. Uh, I have Stefan Diggs ranked at number 11. That's something that you wanted hate. to get into. What's that? Hate. I hate it. Hate it. Darius Slay has been terrific for a while now. Darius Slay has given Odo Beckham fits, and I know Odo Beckham wasn't 100% in their game, but I, let's go back to last year and the year before. He's turned into a better corner that nobody's given respect to, and as of the usage right now, if you look at it, Adam Thielen's been doing more of the slot with Diggs more on the outside. Diggs still sees some use in the slot, but I am worried about Slay on Diggs for this game more than I am worried about Thielen, even with Canyon or Bradford at quarterback. So, I think that the matchup is a problem that people are not going to look into this week. Okay, so where do you think that I should drop Diggs down? Because I think this is a pretty good point. I, I'm actually thinking about now moving Thielen up a little bit. I think those two things correspond. Uh, so even though you're not huge on Adam Thielen, I think I would bump him up if I was going to move Diggs down. But where would you move Diggs yep. down to? 
Uh, but Diggs right behind Tyreek Hill, still in front of Crabtree because that matchup's just as bad. Well, it's funny. Worse. All right, so yeah, I'll drop Diggs down to number 16 in the ranking, still one spot ahead of Michael Crabtree. I have Crabtree ranked at 17. I have Amari Cooper ranked at 31. I know neither one of them did anything last week against uh, Washington, and historically Cooper doesn't do a ton against Denver. I would still have faith that Crabtree would be the one to be able to overcome the bad matchup, though. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I would actually play Devontae Parker and... That might be about it. I'd, I'd, I'd move Crabtree behind Parker, though, for sure. So I got to move down Garcon. I got to move down Diggs. I got to move down Crabtree. And... I mean, even if they get Lattimore back, that being the Saints, Parker and Jay Cutler against the Saints, you know he doesn't give a damn is going to pass that entire game. Yeah, oh, yeah. It just, it, and look, it, Devontae Parker's been quite even. Even if it was in garbage time last week, he still came through for everybody. Hey, garbage time, uh, those count, right? We don't want to get like negative points for garbage time. Yeah, no, no, listen, it was all good by me. I started Devontae Parker everywhere. And that's so. actually, I'm surprised you don't have Jarvis Landry higher. I just, I don't, I, I really love Jarvis Landry in their first game against the Chargers because I think the slot against the Chargers where you really want to exploit them, which could be like an Aguilar thing this week, which is just right. terrifying. But I don't know, man. Like, I, I just, the touchdowns are going to come with Parker. I feel like you're dealing with all floor with Landry and very limited upside. Like, if he gets 17 targets a game, yeah, he's going to be great. But I just don't expect that to happen. Even if he gets nine targets a game, which generally does possess a good floor, I just don't know how much upside is ever associated with it. So I always rank him a little bit lower. I'm just not sold on him. Yeah, but don't you feel better of him than, like, Devontae Adams with Randall Cobb back? Or you were just talking about Sammy Watkins. You don't feel more confident in that target volume? I do feel more confident in his target volume, but I'm also weighing the upside of the other guys that if they do have a good game, it's going to be triple the points of Jarvis Landry. All right, fair enough. And that's sort of the risk that I want to take. Uh, and, and all, like you mentioned earlier, it all depends on your lineup. If I have, like, three risky guys, then, you know, maybe I make a different decision. But if I'm shooting right. for upside, those are the guys that I want. Plus, you can't. Jarvis Landry's not scoring this week because Kenny Stills has to get his revenge touchdown. <laughs> of course, yeah, revenge game. It's all Kenny Stills this week. Uh, so this 31 to – actually, before we go there, uh, Marquise Lee I have ranked at number 22. I feel good about that. I don't know how many others are feeling Marquise Lee with me. Well, what's your take on him? I'm finally – hey, 140 yards in two games as the number one wide receiver now that Allen Robinson's gone. I don't understand why more people are not on Marquise Lee. I wrote him up in the waiver column at Roto Experts again this week saying this is the last I, – I started a new section under the running backs and wide receivers. Last chance. This is the last time I'm mentioning him. I'm not going to keep mentioning him every single week and finding a new way to write the same damn thing every single week. Last time I mentioned it, Marquise Lee is still under 60%. In fact, he's still only around 40%. I don't know what more he has to do as the number one wide receiver for the Jaguars. I understand the trepidation if you play in a standard league because a lot of – he's very Jarvis Landry-esque in that way. Yeah. But I, I like – it's funny because Landry returns punts and he is okay after the catch. But I think that Marquise Lee is actually a little bit better and where he is the number one on his team. When it gets into a situation – I know Hearns has been scoring these late touchdowns, but I wouldn't look at that as something that's regularly going to occur. They even threw a jump ball to like – five foot one Marquise Lee last week because he has a great <laughs> vert in the back of the end zone so I just like the way that he's being incorporated his market share is one of the highest of any receiver in the league right now I know Jacksonville doesn't want to run the ball or pass the ball all that much they want to keep it on the ground but if they're going to throw and the game is going to be close the first look for Blake Bortles is Marquise Lee every single time Yep, Marquise Lee's always had the talent. He just came out of college and thought that he could get away with that and take lazy routes and not have to separate and do everything, the route running that you need to be successful at the NFL level. And he finally figured that out last year, and we saw the change. We saw the light switch come on, and he finally started to really play well. And this is he's, the talent is starting to show up because he's starting to be more precise and taking the game seriously. 31 to 40 range. I mentioned Amari Cooper. He comes in at number 31 here. I don't expect huge things, but he still has enough upside that, you know, he's a fringy low wide receiver three this week for me. Uh, Devin Funches is expecting no Kelvin Benjamin. I, I should probably run through that as well. Uh, Cobb and Watkins I have is playing. Baldwin, John Brown, Mike Williams, Will Fuller, Corey Davis, and Kelvin Benjamin I have is doubtful right now if those guys end up playing. Check back with the rankings and everything will get adjusted. But for the moment, Devin Funches stays at number 32 same correlation paul richardson is number 33 terrell Pryor and jamison crowder 34 and 35 ty hilton willie sneed back from suspension 37 jermaine curse sterling shepherd and alan hearns mr hearns number 40 in the ranking so which guys were the biggest jumps for you and is there anyone in that range outside of ty hilton that you think we should really talk about 
Mm, you know, I'm with you on Devin Funches. I was with him last week as well, so I like that ranking. The Paul Richardson thing is obviously contingent on Doug Baldwin, but I do, I, you know, I have a feeling about Tyler Lock. Well, I'll explain why when we get to him. I'd like Tyler Lockett a little bit better, and there's a reason for it. It's not just, oh, this gut feeling I have. The only one from this range, I think Jameson Crowder is too high. After what we saw last week. I, is, fact, isn't, isn't Pryor too high? Well, everybody is too high. I just think that if you look at it and the fact that the play between the two of them and, yes, Kirk Cousins bounced back. But if you look at the way that they were able to handle Phillip Rivers, Keenan Allen, who actually runs a decent amount of routes out of the slot, and what they did last week in shutting him and Phillip Rivers down, I'm concerned for Jamison Crowder as well this week. All right, so that 40 to 50 range, and just briefly on T.Y. Hilton, I just don't think he has the same impact this week against the Seahawks as he did against the Oh, yeah, I don't have a problem against that. Browns. Um, eventually, Andrew Luck will be back, probably week six, and then T.Y. Hilton will be nice again. Uh, but Tyler Lockett I have at... 45. Why do you like Tyler Lockett so much? Well, so it comes down to the situation that we're going to have here if there's no Doug Baldwin. And the fact is Tyler Lockett runs out of the slot a decent amount of time, but more so, especially if there's no Doug Baldwin, he is going to be the one that sees more of that position. And if you look at the matchup purely, I was like breaking it down. And if you look at where the Colts are really weak is actually that slot position that's the where to exploit them. And if you look at the people that have done well against them, a lot of those routes have come either at that slot, slot flanker type position, and that's Tyler Lockett. And that's really where I'm looking at here is Paul Richardson is going to get his. I don't, I'm not, you're starting both of these guys probably if you need wide receiver help as like three fours type of wide receivers. But I actually think Lockett has the potential for a bigger game given the matchups of how things break down with the Colts. Bryce Butler I have at number 61. You know he only played three snaps in the Monday Nighter? <laughs> I knew it was low. I didn't realize it was that low. Yeah, 90 yards on three snaps and a touchdown. Pretty good for Bryce Butler. I wouldn't go crazy. Uh, if he could eventually win out the wide receiver two on the outside and pass Terrence Williams, and I think a lot of it breaks down into Terrence Williams, at least is perceived as a much better blocker than Bryce right. Butler is. But he's going to have his shots, but he's never anyone I want to rely on. But you know, I, I've heard people talk him up so far this week just based off the big game. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I could see the upside there. The biggest problem is that you just mentioned, though. I mean, you could quadruple it, and it's only finally double digits. That's only still 12. Yeah, that's not that's not the sort of volume I want to invest in. No. I think that with Eifert still out, I know he didn't do anything last week, but Brandon LaFell is still on my radar as like a deep guy that you can still pick up off the waiver wire because anyone who picked him up last week most likely dropped him because he had a piss poor game. Uh, he's someone that I wouldn't feel like comfortable running out, but someone that I could see using if you needed a spot start. Oh, but there's two wide receivers. It's Brandon LaFell in this game and Rashard Higgins. And the fact is you had to make that play for Rashard Higgins based on the week before that and the opportunity that it opened itself up with the injuries here. And it still comes down to the fact that Kaiser is not that great at throwing the ball outside deep downfield as the routes he struggles with. Kenny Britt finally woke up and scored a touchdown. But hold on for one more week before you go dropping Higgins because he still fits better with Kaiser in this offense. So on both sides of the ball, it's LaFell and Higgins where, as you said, not guys I want to start, not guys I want to put in my lineup, but you might have an opportunity where you need to. And, and Richard Higgins has probably been dropped in a lot of leagues uh, yep. following the waiver wire period, so you might be able to scoop him up for free. I would do that too because the targets were still there. Britt obviously had the better game. Britt obviously scored the touchdown this week. I have Britt ranked higher. Uh, I have Kenny Britt at number 50, Higgins at number 51. I have them back-to-back, -back, but I'm not going to give up on Higgins yet either while uh, Corey Coleman is out. It's just, yeah. You know, I don't know necessarily what his upside is, and there's going to be a lot of people who got burned by him last week. So eh, I think 50 is fine. I think you can start him, but just I don't know if the upside is going to be there. I don't even know if the – as we saw last week, the floor wasn't even there for him, even though the market share was. Willie Sneed is the last one I want to talk about. Willie Sneed comes at number 37. Uh, he'll be back in his regular slot position. He'll play around 75% of the snaps. The biggest impact I think he has – is in games where Willie Sneed doesn't play, at least over the past two seasons, Kobe Fleener has scored almost 10 more fantasy points per game than when Willie Sneed plays. So you can't really start go. Kobe Fleener anymore uh, if you were doing that. It's not to say that Kobe Fleener can't score a touchdown. He's going to score touchdowns along the way. It's just he's going to be wildly inconsistent. I'm okay with playing Willie Sneed, by the way, as a low-end wide receiver three. Absolutely, on all accounts, as soon as the suspension happened and everybody was asking who who steps up for Willie Sneed, is it going to be Coleman? Is it going to be this guy or that guy? It was like they didn't really have an answer. The benefit was Kobe Fleener. I 100% agree with you. Kobe Fleener is now back into that top to middle end tight end two range because Willie Sneed is just fine. I, I'm with you. Put him right back in your lineup, especially in a PPR. The only person left out that I wanted to talk about 
was Brandon Marshall being able to take a care of this matchup with Vernon Hargraves after exactly what we saw last week where this guy has just been almost a – he's basically been a bust this at this point and the size and what we saw last week is Eli Manning – didn't just target him at the end of the game like he did the first two weeks. This is the first game we got to see him play with almost 100% Odell Beckham. And Eli Manning looked his way throughout the entire game finally. And I think that Brandon Marshall is going to be able to just dominate this matchup. And not to the point where I say dominate, not like he's going to be top 25 wide receiver, but he's going to have no problem with Hargreaves when he's, when he's on matched up with him. Uh, I have Brandon Marshall at number 65 in the rankings. Yeah. I'm not changing that. I want to see it one more week before I'm not convinced that <laughs> Put him he's washed up. Kendall Wright got a zero. Put him over Kendall Wright. Yeah, listen, they're going to have to pass more in this game. I don't care. I, I, listen, I, I bumped up Sterling Shepard. I have Beckham at number two. Like, let's... I want to see it again, Brandon Marshall, all right? Man, receivers, Larry Fitzgerald last week, Brandon Marshall this week. All right, you might be exactly right. It won't be happening in my lineups. <laughs> Quarterbacks, let's start flying through these. I go Rodgers, Brady, Breeze, Russell Wilson uh, in that soft matchup Sunday night against the Colts. Mariota, Trevor Simeon at number six, who draws one of the best matchups of the week against the Raiders. Matt Ryan, Cam Newton at number eight. Phillip Rivers, number nine, Kirk Cousins. This is it for me and Cam. I know Cam has been horrible. Uh, uh, he really couldn't. This is a top five matchup for quarterbacks. They're projected to be down in this game. They're projected to be throwing a lot like last week, to be perfectly honest with you. If you can't do it here, like, do you just cut Cam? Yeah, uh, we already did last week. Actually, so Cam Newton and Derek Carver, the two that I highlighted, that they're nowhere near my QB1 range this week. Okay, where do you have Cam? I actually have Cam down at 19. Okay, where do you have Derek Carr? 18. Okay, so the rest of the top 10 go, or the rest of the rankings go, Derek Carr at number 10, uh, Jay Cutler 12, Alex Smith, Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz, Stafford, Tyrod Taylor, Dak Prescott, Brian Hoyer, and then Jared Goff. Uh, Who are the guys that you have ranked up then in that situation? Where Uh, where do you have Simeon? uh, Simeon, I actually have a 12. Okay. Uh, I I have a little bit of a problem with that, but uh, we don't need to debate. For everything he did well in the first two games, and I kept complimenting him, I even sent it to you, is how smart he played those games. He went the exact opposite, pulled a 180 last week. I think there's going to be a distinct thing between Simeon on the road and Simeon at home. I think that's going to prove itself out throughout the course of the season. worth watching. Hey, I I will be looking for that. I I wouldn't put him that – at 12, he's still a QB1 for me. But the big movers, the big ones that jump for me is Dak Prescott is still a QB1 for me. He somehow just continues to produce. I don't like how he's been playing, but he gets up there, and it's not that bad of a matchup, as I mentioned. This defense has actually been struggling. And then Carson Palmer. I love this matchup. Carson Palmer's been great outside of week one. He's been everything you wanted for the Andrew Luck owner. Yeah, I mean, what do I have? I have Palmer at what number twenty-one. Yeah, 21. maybe I, I, maybe I am too low on him. I just I don't know, man. Carson Palmer, like half his passes are bounce passes, and like if Larry if Larry Fitzgerald doesn't make miraculous catches, he's Mark ripping it in the passes. <laughs> like it, it's I don't know. You, you just watch him and he doesn't look good. Like it looks like he's about washed up. But he's producing at the last two weeks very well. Three hundred yards, touchdowns a plenty. Uh, this is going to be another good week for him. All right, and listen, maybe I'll shift up the quarterback rankings a little bit. Everyone can check that out on DK Playbook. But I actually do believe in Simeon this week. He's a streamer sensation. Even for DraftKings this week, uh, he's a nice price. He's someone that I would even consider using in cash. Even if you want to, tr- even if you want to triple stack Simeon, Sanders, and DT, I would do that. That's int- hey, that's intriguing. I bet you'd be one of the only few doing it. That's that's the best part about it. The only other big mover I have, I have Andy Dalton a lot higher, but just because of Bill Lazor and what we saw last week. The yards haven't been there yet, but I think this is the week that everything starts to click because it was only the first week with Lazor, and it's a great matchup with the Browns. It is a great matchup, but last week was a great matchup that he was able to exploit for like 20 minutes, and then he turned back into Andy Dalton again. It's the first game under Laser doing the play calling. I think it's going to be better. He's only 15 for me. He's not a QB1, but I think this week is going to be continued improvement. I, I wanted to rank Deshaun Watson higher. I just couldn't pull the trigger on it. I have him at number 14. I just think he's going to produce fantasy points. It's almost like Kaiser in a weird way. Like, and I guess Brissett in bad matchups as well. Just what he can do with his legs is just going to be so nice for a floor every single week. He look the way that he's playing though, and him Kaiser, especially Kaiser with the inter- three touchdowns, seven interceptions. I could at least live with Watson. Okay, 
Tight ends. Uh, I go Gronk at number one. Then, oh, you're crazy. Then, yeah, then, then, I mean, if I was doing fantasy pros, it might be a huge knock against me when Mercedes Lewis scores 20 touchdowns this week. <laughs> uh, so Gronk, number one, Kelsey, Ertz, Walker, Reed, Graham, Ebron, Watson, Evan Ingram, and Jesse James. And the big thing with Jesse James, and I pointed this out on the Waiver Wire show, uh, Warren Sharp did a nice analysis of how you attack the Ravens defense and really exploit them. And it is through the tight end. And we've seen that Ben's not afraid to go to Jesse James in situations where it makes a lot of sense. I don't think that he's a pickup for the rest of the season, but if you need a streaming tight end for this week, Vance McDonald looks like he's going to miss the game again, that Jesse James, I think is going to be an excellent streamer and he's worthy of a top 10 ranking here. Yeah, that's a very good point. There's one of the few out there. And obviously the other one, which we haven't got to yet. I'll, I'll wait until you get to him. All right, just tell me who it is, and we can bring up the board, and people can see Cameron Braid. He's Braid. Yeah, make Braid again. Make America Braid again. Look, what's happened the first three weeks for the Giants? Fifty plus yards and a touchdown to all three tight ends, Witten, and then you saw Eric Ebron, and then of course last week all over again with Zach Ertz. So Cameron Braid against this Giants that they don't know how to stop a tight end because maybe you should stop ignoring the linebacker position. Just start your tight ends against the Giants. Uh, well, this came into a situation when I was doing the rankings. You can see it goes James, Rudolph, Clay, Doyle, Safarian Jenkins, Griffin, then Braid. So I want to kind of break up the streamers just a little bit in terms of what they do. So if I'm shooting for that touchdown upside in a big game, I think that Jesse James I prefer slightly more than Cameron Braid. But I think that they're, they're of the same ilk this week. Of the other guys in between, I think they're more floor guys. Whether it is Rudolph, Clay, Doyle's going to get the target. Safarian Jenkins is just such an easy out in that offense. And I think that Ryan Griffin showed that without C.J. Fedorowicz around, that he has built up the rapport with Deshaun Watson. And he's going to be, I wouldn't say lock him in for seven targets, but he's going to be in that five to eight range. And that's where I see those targets going. Like even last week with Brait, if he doesn't score the touchdown, he doesn't do all that much. Like I think that he probably only gets five or so targets. They might be red zone targets, but he still has to haul those in. And depending on game flow, they might be able to run and run and run over the Giants if they get up in this game. So that would be my only hesitation. I agree with you. I like the matchup. I prefer Jesse James though. No, I, I have no problem with the Jesse James factor. And to throw a little nugget out there for well as well, too, Rich Rebar, a friend of ours, too, uh, the only two teams to allow a top 12 tight end in all three weeks are the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New York Giants. So there's your Austin Severian Jenkins nugget right there, too. All right, defenses before we close this out, because Jake's got to go. Uh, Seattle is at number one, and that's no shocker, against the Colts. Uh, Green Bay, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Tampa, Baltimore, KC, Arizona, Cincinnati, and the Rams at number 10. I think they can turn Dak over a few times or at least get to him if he starts scrambling around. And that just leads to a lot more sacks if they have to pass in this game. Um, is there any defense that you particularly feel good about? Because streamers, for me, this week, people were asking me about Jacksonville. Like, oh, how do you not have Jacksonville in your stream rankings? Like, They're owned in like 100% of ESPN. <laughs> They're hard to stream if they're not available. So Green Bay, home, defense, Thursday night against Mike Glennon. I do like that, yep. although the defense itself is not very good. It's just going to generate a lot of volume against, which has the opportunity for just picks, sacks, fumbles, scores, everything that you want. Uh, even if they give up 17 points, I'm not too concerned about it. Tennessee, I think against Houston, uh, that's a situation where you're going to have to ask Watson to pass. I could see Watson with like a two-touchdown, two-pick performance, turn one of those picks into something nice, then boom, you're well on your way. Tampa is widely available and the Cardinals are widely available against the 49ers as well so those are like the four that I think you could pick up and play right away yeah Cardinals are top five defense for me this week and then you mentioned the Buccaneers I'll actually take either defense on the other side of this because a lot of people have dropped the Giants after the first two weeks I know some got on board but if you look at it Jameis Winston has been an interception machine so far making very poor decisions like he always has and we thought he was taking a step forward after last year and he's the same Jameis Winston all over again and if you're looking at facing Eli Manning still throws interceptions himself so I like both defenses in that game it'd almost be a coin flip of which one I want I'd probably just lean to the Bucks because they're at home Jake Seeley, check him out on Twitter at All In Kid, and you can find his standard PPR and half point PPR rankings up at RotoExperts.com. And Jake, where can everyone watch and listen to you on a daily basis? <laughs> All the freaking time, everywhere. <laughs> uh, Fancy Sports Network, the YouTube pages where I hey, release my rankings a day later than you, though. You get the step ahead of me. And then, of course, the Fancy Sports Radio Network, 9 to 11 a.m. and 4 to 6 in the afternoon. That's the award-winning one, uh, Monday through Fridays. And you can download the FNTSY radio app uh, on Android and iOS or go to FNTSY.com slash radio and listen live for free there. I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You want to 
check out the Facebook page because that's where I post my betting cheat sheet for the week after we do the Thursday show. Also, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Audio Boom for all the audio versions and the big one, the video version, the DraftKings YouTube page. Check it out there. And you can find my short, quick hits on the DK Live app, free to download on Android and iOS. I'm Pat Mayo. Good luck this week. I'll see you next time.